Two weeks ago, uh, on a Thursday morning, uh, I got my family up at 6 a.m., my three-year-old, my one-year-old, I got them dressed in fancy clothes. We drove uh, down to the Plano Event Center and stood in line with 700 other people from all the kind of surrounding counties because, after eight years, uh, my wife Claudia was becoming an American citizen. So we were going to celebrate with her. We thought it was going to be at around 7.30. It wasn't. It was at 10.30. So we, I waited a bit with the two kids, but it was fine. Uh, so uh, they, uh, the two kids and me went around into the family room, waited for a couple hours. I had Despicable Me Too going on my phone as I was listening into the ceremony. And Claudia and everybody else who was uh, going to become a citizen that day went a different way, went into a, a big room like this. Uh, heard a message from our president, said the Pledge of Allegiance, sung the national anthem, and then raised their right hand and took the oath of citizenship, this oath. I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign sovereign or prince or state of whom I have heretofore been subject or citizen. I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I will bear arms uh, if necessary and required by law. I will perform works of national importance under civilian direction when required by law. And I take this oath and obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. So help me God." Though my wife was born in Norway and raised in Norway, and she gets to keep dual citizenship, but, you know, look past that for the sake of the analogy. If she wants to become an American, right, she wants to become a citizen of this land and this country and this kingdom, it means renouncing all other kingdoms, Ikea and all the other things that the Scandinavians try to push on us, right? That's yeah, Sweden. Renouncing all other kingdoms if you want to join this kingdom. We go to war with Norway, Claudia has one choice. Uncle Sam, right? She bears arms against her former Viking kingdom because she has now joined this kingdom. And today, we are going to begin the final section of the Sermon on the Mount, this, this great big long sermon, the most famous sermon that's ever been preached, that Jesus is preaching on the shores of Galilee, and he's done with teaching. We've heard our teachings on prayer and fasting and giving, and now it's time for a choice. For the hundreds potentially listening to him on the shores of Galilee, and 2,000 years later, the hundreds in this room, you've heard what the kingdom is like. You've heard about the people of the kingdom. You've heard about the hearts of the people of the kingdom of God. And now it is time to choose today whom you will serve. Will you choose this kingdom of God and therefore renounce all other worldly kingdoms, or will you choose the other kingdoms of the world and therefore renounce the kingdom of God? And Jesus is going to tie this up with four pictures that we're going to look to over the next four weeks. We're going to see today two ways. Next week, we'll see two different trees that bear two different kinds of fruit. After that, we'll see two different pleas or oaths or, or claims before Jesus. And then finally, we'll see two different houses, all drawing the same picture of true disciples who have crowned Jesus as king, enter into the kingdom of God and renounce all other kingdoms and false disciples who have not crowned him, who have attempted to kill him and have renounced him and his kingdom and follow the ways of the world. So today we're going to look at uh, the first of these four pictures, the two different ways. Which way are you going to choose? And by implication, which way are you going to forsake? And in my opinion, uh, these next four weeks are, are maybe some of the heaviest words in the Gospels, maybe some of the heaviest words in all of the scriptures, we're going to hear Jesus Christ say, it is incredibly difficult to follow me, and few do. We're going to hear him say in two weeks things like, there will be many, many who think they have followed me their whole life, who come skipping to the judgment seat and present their works before me, and they will hear the most terrifying words anyone could hear, I never knew you and they will spend an eternity apart from me, right? It's a little uncomfortable, can be. 
We're having a nice small talk in the lobby. We're going to have a nice picnic after this, and then we're going to watch some football. And now i got to face you know, my eternal reality. Right? It kind of can ruin your weekend a little bit. So I want to give us four encouragements to kind of help us uh, resist the urge to tune out or resist the urge to be offended and then think about other things and check our phones or perhaps to close our ears and medicate ourselves with something that might make us feel a bit more comfortable. Three quick things before we enter today's sermon and then really the next month, the next four sermons. Number one, if something Jesus says scares you, let it scare you. If something Jesus says scares you or makes you uncomfortable, or makes you lose a little sleep tonight, or makes you shift around in your chair, there may be a reason for it. You may be on the broad way. You may be a tree bearing false fruit, and therefore his words are a gracious warning to you. It is a good thing to lose some sleep if it makes a difference for eternity. If something he says scares you, let it scare you. Number two, If you are a Christian, if you have trusted in him, if you have looked to him for your righteousness and not yourself, heavy warnings in a very strange way should bring comfort because you remembered what he saved you from. Heavy warnings, heavy sermons about going the broad and easy way that leads to eternal destruction and an eternal hell shouldn't make you just sit in false condemnation, but rather should make you love him all the more. You see what he's saved you from. So if you're a Christian, if you've trusted in him, let that happen. Let this remind you of the joy of your salvation and learn the difference between the the gracious sting of conviction, the sting of the spirit that actually points you to Jesus and the shameful false condemnation of the devil that points you away from him. Learn the difference between those two. Be very eager for the sting of the Spirit and be very eager to let Romans 8 ring through your ears when you hear the whispers of the devil. Remind yourself there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He has set me free by his righteousness, not mine. So heavy words, if you've trusted in him, should bring comfort, not false condemnation. And then number three, maybe the most important Remember who it is that's speaking. Look at verse 13. Look at the first five words, I should say. Enter by the narrow gate. Before he says one heavy word about people who come to him and him say, I never knew you, one word about the broad way that leads to destruction, hear the merciful, loving heart of your Savior begging you, choose life. He's giving you the answer long before the test. I've got these two kids that I got dressed to go to Claudia's ceremony. And like, uh, you know, I put them in every sermon because I just have, like when they were born, I I thought I had like this much love. And then it just like exploded my heart in every uh, possible way. Like they they created new little chambers in my heart because I just love them so much. And when they are close to danger, the louder I scream. My love for them, my longing for them to never be hurt or any things like that makes me scream louder, right, when they're walking into oncoming traffic. Let me rephrase that. When Joe is walking towards oncoming traffic and Harvey is obediently standing beside me, right? (laughs) Don't miss the loving heart of your Savior giving these heavy words. There's a tendency to just think, whoa, that's a bit extreme. That guy must be, you know, a little too much for me but rather see the heart of a Savior who's saying, turn around, you're walking towards that cliff. I want you this way, the way that leads to life. Don't miss who it is that's giving these heavy warnings over the next four weeks. So with that in mind, let's actually look at this passage. There's there's two ways that leaves us one choice. Let's look at these two ways. Verse 13, enter by the narrow gate, For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So Jesus is painting a picture for us of a journey that everyone who has ever breathed air is 
on. There's two gates that lead to two different paths that have two different groups on them and two different destinations that they both lead to. So let's look at this first one, the, the wide way or the broad and easy way. Verse 13, again, for the gate is wide, the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many. The first thing we see is the gate is wide. It's big, it's flashy, it's pretty, it's attractive. There's neon lights, spotlights all around it to draw you towards it. It's wide enough to, to accommodate a multitude of people. Thousands, millions can stream in with no problem whatsoever. It captures the attention. And as you approach it and you walk through the wide gate, we see the way on the other side of the gate is easy. The idea here is just travel on this road is, is, is simple, right? It's painless. There's no potholes. There's no barriers, right? I grew up in Denton, Texas. It's been under construction since its inception. It's very, very dangerous to drive, right? Not so with the Broadway, right? There's no potholes. It's straight. It's clear, right? There's no boundaries or limits. You can do whatever you want, right, on this Broadway. Anything that serves your own happiness. You're unhappy in your marriage, get a divorce, Right? There's no rules on the Broadway. Do whatever it takes to fulfill your own happiness. Right? You don't like a certain standard of truth? Just make up your own truth. Right? You get to define what's true and what's not true on the Broadway. There's no signposts telling you where to go or telling you what you must do. Something infuriates you, something somebody says or something you see on the news, you just let that bitterness fester. And you go to Twitter and you just vent. Right? You do whatever you want on this Broadway. Nothing can tell you uh, what to do or how to live, right? Everything on the Broadway is a means to your ultimate end. Whatever you want to do, you can do. Build the lifestyle you want to live. Build the community that kind of suits your values and join it. Everything is ultimately about you. The way is easy. Now, this doesn't mean uh, that you get everything you want. It doesn't mean everybody on the broad, broad road, uh, the broad way is rich or is just getting constant promotions, right? It doesn't mean you get everything you want. It means you will ultimately do whatever you want. You'll ultimately do whatever you want. You are the God of your own life. Nobody tells you what to do. So the gate wide, the way is easy, and the group that's on this easy road is many, right? This is the road most traveled. It's the most popular, right? It's the ro road that everybody's on by default. You're born in front of the road, if you will. We're all born this side of Genesis 3, believing we're the God of our own life and just doing whatever we want to, to indulge the flesh, right? So we're all born and we naturally funnel our way through this big, flashy gate, uh, a couple of years ago, Claudia and I were in Rome, and we wanted to go to the Vatican. I wanted to go see the Pope. He wasn't available, but we went anyway. Uh, so we, we didn't know this because uh, we don't read Italian uh, newspapers, but that day there was a strike with all the taxis and all the subways at a certain time. And it just so happened that as we were walking down uh, the subway tunnel to go to the subway car, uh, it was almost the last car of the day. So we're walking, you know, eating you know, spaghetti or whatever at 8 a.m. Uh, and people around us start to sprint. And we're like, okay, I guess there's this, we just sprint here. So we start to run and everyone's running. So we're running and then we get to the platform and it is packed. And Claudia and I are standing next to each other. And as the, the subway cars open, we're just forced. I don't even think I walked. I was just shoulder to shoulder and pushed into this car. And somehow I ended up on one side and Claudia ended up on the other side. We just kind of waved to each other. Uh, that's the idea here. You are, you are pushed in because everybody wants to enter through this broad gate. Everybody wants to go on the, narrow, or the, the broad, easy way. But where does it lead? What is its destination? Jesus says, destruction. It's a glamorous gate. It's a comfortable way. There will be many on it to affirm all of your life decisions, everybody to make you feel good about yourself, but it's leading to a cliff. It leads to destruction. One of the most terrifying things, if not the most terrifying thing about uh, the devil, 
about your flesh, about sin itself, is that uh, the devil doesn't look like how we depict him in shows. It's not this, you know, hooded figure with black smoke, you know, going around him and he, like, very obvious, like horns and stuff like that, where you're like, that is the bad guy. Yeah, we're all in agreement, right? The devil doesn't do that. How does Paul, how do the scriptures describe the devil? He appears as an angel of light, and so do his followers. The false teaching scratches your itching ears, takes good things, right? The devil looks like a good guy. He tells you what you want to hear. He'll help you justify your own actions, right? He'll take a good thing and just twist it a little bit. We saw this when Jesus was tempted by the devil back in Matthew 4. He's hungry. He's fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and the devil shows up and says, here's some food. Why don't you take and eat? He's hungry. There's the food. Meet the need. What's so wrong about that? But why is he doing it? He's doing it to draw Jesus away from trusting in his Father for his ultimate provision. And Jesus says, man doesn't live by bread alone, but every mouth that comes from, every word that comes from the mouth of God, he'll take a good thing and twist it. Carl, uh, every other Wednesday night, we've been having Narnia nights. He's been reading uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe to the elementary and preschool uh, kids. And uh, I don't know if you're there yet. Have you all gotten to The Witch yet? Yeah? He just gave me a very subtle nod. Is this uncomfortable that I'm talking to you all on the stage? No, not not uncomfortable. Okay. Uh, When Edmund shows up and runs into the white witch, who's the devil, C.S. Lewis gets this exactly right. She's tall and beautiful and fair, and she offers Edmund Turkish delight, which, if you don't know what it is, sounds great, and if you've had it, it breaks down the analogy because it's, it's bad. It doesn't taste good in any way, but if you haven't had it, just imagine it tastes better than how it really tastes in real life. So C.S. Lewis is zeroing in on this. The devil takes good things. The way is broad, and the way is easy. Come this way. Everybody else is doing it, and it's leading to eternal destruction. That's terrifying. That's terrifying. And that is exactly how the enemy works. That is exactly how your flesh will work as it tries to draw you towards the broad way. You'll hear things like, why is everybody just trying to change you? Why is everybody telling you to lay your life down and deny yourself? Doesn't God want you to be happy? Why can't you just be you? Can't you just express yourself? Why can't everybody just get on board for how you're made? Why are they always trying to change it? Right? Things like that. You'll hear things that sound good. Yeah, that sounds right. I was made this way. Right? It sounds great. It's opposite of the gospel, but it sounds great. And that's exactly the type of things you'll hear on the broad way, something that scratches your itching ears because the devil very much wants, very much wants you happy on your way to hell doesn't want you showing up, wait, why are we following this ugly guy with horns? No, it's how do we, why are we following this beautiful, white, Turkish delight giving witch, right? Very much wants you thinking, this is the way you should go. Everybody else is doing it. That's the broad, easy way. And Jesus says, don't go that way. Don't go that way. It has a destination you can't avoid, and that destination is destruction. You can have your best life now, but only now. There is a cliff at the end of this easy road. Don't be enticed by it, our Savior says. That's the first way. That's the first gate and the first road, and there's a second way. Let's look at verse 14. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. The gate, it's not this big, beautiful, broad, wide gate. It's narrow. And notice, you have to find it. It's not like two gates next to each other. Do I take the ugly one or do I take the pretty one? No, it's you just see the wide neon lights gate, and you have to go search and try to find the narrow gate. You have to forsake the big flashy lights and go search around. And when you do finally find the narrow gate, you got to kind of squeeze through it. You almost don't even know it's a gate because the way is so narrow and strange. And once you uncomfortably find it and then squeeze through it, on the other side of this gate is a very, very difficult, hard 
way. There's many twists and turns. There's hills and roadblocks. Rather than self-indulgence, this is the path of self-denial. Rather than indulging in all the pleasures of the flesh or the comforts of the world, you deny them. This is the road where you are not God, God is God. Your life is not yours to spend however you want. Your life is his to lay down for his glory. Your life is for other people to lay down for their comfort and to bear their burdens and to encourage others and to consider others better than yourself. It's not the easy, comfortable way. And if that wasn't enough, on this way you also be persecuted, you also be hated, you will be maligned, you will suffer, and when that happens... You have to turn the other cheek. You don't get the satisfaction of revenge here. Even when hate flies your way, you return it with love for your enemies, and you pray for those who persecute you. That's the hard way. It's a narrow gate. It's a hard way, and those who find it are few. The group here is not many. It's few. This is not a popular way. This way goes against the grain of culture. You go this way, it's going to be difficult, and everyone who sees you on this way will mock you as simple-minded. They will call you foolish. Why would you go that way when this is clearly the right way? Look how many people are on this broad way. You'll be called a bigot for holding to truth. You'll be called woke or postmodern or a communist if you encourage someone to speak the truth in love or you encourage someone to love your neighbor. There's no winning with culture if you're on the narrow way. So the gate is narrow. The way is Hard and there's few travelers on it, but look at the destination. It leads to life. The way is hard, but the destination is glorious. J.C. Ryle, who's a 19th century English preacher, says this about the narrow way. Repentance and faith in Christ and holiness of life have never been fashionable. The true flock of Christ has always been small, It must not move us to find that we are reckoned singular or peculiar or bigoted or narrow-minded. This is the narrow way. Surely it is better to enter life eternal with a few than to go to destruction with great company. So there's the two ways, broad way, the narrow way. So the question is, which way, which path, which gate have we entered through? Which road are we on? How do you discern? How do you know which one you're on? You can't know just by looking at your circumstances. You can't just say, who's rich and successful? They must be on the broad way. Who's poor and has a hard life? They must be on the narrow way. There's thousands, millions who will starve to death this year who are very much on the broad way. You can't just look at your circumstances. You can't just look at your works. You can't just say, who goes to church? or who prays, or who says they're a Christian, or who says they're on the narrow way. If we've learned anything from the Sermon on the Mount, all throughout chapter 6, you've got Pharisees that pray, and you've got tax collectors who pray. You've got sinners who fast, and you've got the self-righteous who fast. What's the difference? One does it so that the whole world might see, and that they might get great glory from it. One does it in their closet with the door shut so that only their heavenly Father sees. There's many prayers on the broad road. There's many churchgoers on the broad road. We can't just look at, their, at your works. So the way you decide, discern is simply by asking the question, who is this life for? Who is my life ultimately for? Who are, who are these prayers for? Who is this giving for or this fasting for? Is it so that everybody sees and I'm the holy one? Look how much that person prays, right? Like the Pharisees, or is it in secret so that only your heavenly Father sees? I have one person I care about seeing me, and that is my heavenly Father who sees in secret. Who is your life for? What are you on that path for? Rather, who are you on that path for? Right? Is it this big gate? It's pretty, and so it drew me. It, it kind of met my desires. This way is easy. It allows me to kind of express myself, right? There's like-minded people on this road that kind of meet my views, right? My desires, my happiness, my comfort, or is it quite simply, he's on this road 
the narrow way it leads to him. That's why I'm here. My life is for him. A question, the diagnostic question we need to ask ourselves as Bible Belt Christians, as people in church, right? Everyone here either is a member of this church, an attender, or, you know, got tricked in here by your friends. But regardless, I would assume you're mildly interested in God. And so the, the question we need to constantly be asking ourselves in Dallas, Texas, is, is God a means or is he an end? Is God a means to some other end, namely your happiness, your comfort, or is he the ultimate end that everything is for? Is he just a divine butler that when things are going bad, you'll ask him to fix it, and then once things are good, you'll say thanks, and then you can go back to your chambers until I need you again? Is he a divine therapist who, when you're sad, right, you want him to come tell you nice things, and once you're not sad anymore, he can go back to his office until you need him again? Is he a divine politician that you get to use whenever something makes you upset, the liberals? And so we want to push our conservative values because right, we love God, right? Do we use God to meet some other end, namely me, my happiness? Is he a means to another end, or is he the glorious end of all ends? He is the infinite, eternal, glorious God who hung the stars in the sky and holds the galaxies in the palm of his hand. Before he says, let there be light, he's worthy of all praise and glory just because of who he is. Yet he created me. He scooped us up from the dirt and breathed life into us. Why? And if that was enough, even after we rebel against him, he comes after us, sends his own son to lay down his life for us so that we might be brought into his family and have fellowship with him and, and bask in his glory and, and love him and be known by him. What is man that you are mindful of me, that you care for me, that you would send your son for me? Do you see the eternal difference between those two? Because there is an eternal difference between those two. One is a path that leads to eternal destruction. The other is a path that leads to him, that leads to life. Is God a means to some other end? You're on the broad way if he is. Or is he the ultimate end? Is he the life at the end of the hard way that you will do whatever it takes to get to? Two ways, which leave us with one choice. We see the broad way, the narrow way. You're standing in front of these two gates, and you have one choice as a result. There's two options. We've said this over and over and over again. It's one of the themes of Matthew. You have two options. Crown Jesus Christ as your King and Lord, or kill him, reject him. Be a citizen of Norway or of America, right? You must choose, and you must swear off every other sovereign when you choose. You choose the broad way, you're saying goodbye to the narrow way and the life at the end of it. You choose the narrow way. You're swearing off the world and all of its pleasures and all of its comfort. We often want both. We want, obviously, the broad, easy way, but the life at the end of it. My best life now and my best life later. Right? And Jesus says, no, no, no. It doesn't work like that. You have one choice, two options, no third. You can have it now. Indulge the flesh, or you can have eternal glory later, but you can't have both. And then with this option before us, go back to the beginning of verse 13 and hear those first five words from your Savior. Enter by the narrow gate that leads to life. Why? Why should we do it? Why should you neglect the big neon lights? Why should you neglect the, the big crowd that's flooding through? They all seem happy. They've all found nice groups that are just echo chamber affirming everything they believe, and they hate everyone who doesn't believe in them. That looks like an easy life. There's not that much persecution there. The way seems really easy. Why should we reject that for this narrow gate I've got to find and then this difficult way? Why should you do that? And there's one reason. It's the only way that he is on. It's the only way that leads to the life that is your Savior. I am the way, he says. I am the truth. I am the life. It's the only way that leads to him. And he is the only one worth losing everything for. 
Jesus Christ is the only one who's worth losing all of the world for. Paul lays this out famously in Philippians 3 when he talks about himself, says, I I used to be king of the broad way, of the easy way. I had everything in all of the spheres that I ran in. I was at the top and I lost it all. Philippians 3, 4 through 8. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. I had everything. I was top of the top. In the verse 7, <laughs> but whatever gain I had, I, count, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. All the, the, the pleasures and the pomp of the easy way is rubbish compared to the surpassing worth of knowing him, of gaining him, Paul says. He's the only one. It's, it's the only way that leads to him. At the end of this road, I lay everything down so that I might get him. The road is hard. It's the road of self-denial. You'll lay down everything. You'll forego things that other people are saying, come and in. But what you gain, or rather who you gain, at the end of the way is infinitely worth it. It's why Paul would say things like, I don't consider the sufferings of this life even worth comparing to the glory that's to come to me at the end of the hard road. All these sufferings, and he went through many. He went through probably more than anybody in this room will ever go through. It's not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed when I reach the destination of life, when I reach the destination of my Savior. So he is the destination of the road, and he's also with you on the road. Going down the hard road is really just following after Jesus. When he calls you towards discipleship, what does he say? Pick up your cross and follow me. Pick up this instrument of suffering and follow me down the difficult way. He's walked this way before us. Look at John 15. This is him talking to his disciples before he's about to go to the cross. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. If you were of the the broad, easy way, everyone would love you. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. There is no trial you will face on the hard road that he has not faced. There is no insult that will be hurled your way that has not first hit him. We've picked up our cross and we're following him. He's gone before us and he will be with you on the road. The last words of this book we were in when we get to Matthew 28, as Jesus is sending out his disciples on the hard road to go make more disciples, his last words are, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. Hebrews 13 says, he will never leave you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Paul, again, as he's traveled this narrow way, he's in prison for the second time, is writing to Timothy, and this is what he says as he's going to his first defense, and everyone deserts him. Every friend deserts him. Every family member deserts him. He's left by himself. He says this, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me. All deserted me. That's a hard road. Everyone deserted me right when I needed them most. May it not be charged against them. Verse 17. (laughs) But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. I will never leave you or forsake you. It's not just he's there. He's the goal at the end. We just got to kind of white knuckle it as we go along. And then finally, we'll get to him. He says, I'm with you on the road. 
I'm your comfort, and I'm your joy in the midst of the pain. We see this all throughout the book of Psalms, this, this weird tension of suffering and pain and trials and death that is near at hand, and yet otherworldly joy that can only be found in God's nearness to us. Look at Psalm 27. Let's look at these two things, the, the threat of death that's so close, and yet the worship and the joy in the heart of the psalmist. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. So notice the scene here. He's there cowering in a cave. An army has encamped around him, and they've now gotten up and are sprinting towards him with their spears and their swords and their arrows ready to fly at him. And what does he say? One thing have I asked the Lord that I will seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. As the army is sprinting, cursing my name, he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Verse 10, my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. You see that tension there of incredible pain. I haven't been forsaken by my uh, father and mother. This psalmist has, and what's his confidence? The Lord will take me in. He'll draw me near to him. I will gaze upon his beauty, and I will sing praises as people try to kill me constantly. We see this in the most famous psalm, Psalm 23, in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. As I'm walking through it, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. In the midst of the valley, in the midst of the hard road, you're with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. As the enemies are there, again, trying to assault, God sets a table and has a feast. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. That's the tension of the hard road. The Christian life is a hard, painful life with an otherworldly joy, with a peace that surpasses all understanding that is only found in knowing him and drawing near to him who is with you, who will never leave you or forsake you. His nearness will make all the pain of the hard road endurable. And when you get to the life at the end of the way, it will make it look like a flea bite. It won't be worth comparing, like Paul says. Charles Spurgeon says this, I tell you that there is a mirth to be found in faith in Christ which cannot be matched. Speaking of their buoyant spirits who make merry in the dance or the festive glee of those who are filled with wine, it is only the crackling of a handful of thorns under a pot. That's a 200-year-old way of saying all the pleasures of, of the broad way are, are, are fickle things that will vanish like that. How soon it is gone. But the joy of the man who meditates on the love of Christ, which embraces him, on the blood of Christ, which cleanses him, on the arm of Christ, which upholds him, on the hand of Christ, which leads him of the crown of Christ, which is to be his portion. The joy of such a man is constant, deep, overflowing, and beyond the power of expression. The lowliest Christian in all the world, bedridden, living on parish allowance, full of pain and ready to die, when his heart rests on Jesus Christ, would not change places with the youngest, brightest, richest, noblest spirit to be found outside the church of God. We don't walk the hard way, Christian, with our fingers crossed, hoping we'll make it, just trying to white-knuckle it, maybe one day we'll get some relief. We walk 
confidence with the hope in our Savior who is with us, who will never leave us or forsake us, and your brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't forget he has saved you into a family of fellow hard road journeyers, not just to hang out with, to have some laughs on your way to the destination of life, but to bear one another's burdens, to encourage one another, to consider others better than yourself, to carry you, if need be, a little bit further down the road. Uh, These past three months, I can't tell you how many times uh, I read one email that almost took me out, and then I would get another email from you providentially 20 minutes later that was just a, a breath of fresh air. It was like life was literally being pumped into me. I can read this and know the difficulties of the hard road and know the grace that the church is. He has saved you into a family of fellow hard road journeyers. Look to your family to lift your eyes up to the Savior who is with you when our eyes tend to drift down. There's some ammo for Tim for the next sermon. Tim's been taking shots at me with his sermons. It's just, you know, I don't know if you guys have noticed it as much as I have. Uh, (laughs) Choose the narrow way. It's hard. It's painful. There's a lot of suffering, and it's glorious. It's the only way where your Savior is. And there is an otherworldly joy on it that can only be found in him. Go find that narrow gate, because when you find it, you will find him. And walk down the hard way, looking to him and resting in him, knowing that there will be a day where you reach that destination of life. And he will take your weary face in his hands, and he will wipe away your tears, and he will say, well done, my good and faithful traveler, enter in to my rest, enter into my joy, sit at my table, for all of eternity. I mentioned a few weeks ago, I've been reading uh, Adoniram Judson's uh, biography. He was a missionary a couple hundred years ago to Burma, modern day Myanmar, and uh, he wanted to marry uh, Anne Hazeltine uh, right before he was gonna go, and so he decided to ask her father uh, for her hand, and this is the letter he wrote to her father uh, a couple weeks, honestly, before getting on a boat. Uh, to sail away to Burma. Now I ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring, to see her no more in this world, whether you can consent to her departure, to her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life, whether you can consent to her exposure to the danger of of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degrading insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home, who died for her and for you, and for the sake of the perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God, Can you consent to all this in hope that soon, in hopes of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory, with the crown of righteousness brightened with acclamations of praise, which shall redound to her Savior from the heathen saved through her means, from eternal woe and despair? Will you let your daughter go on this narrow, difficult way with me? And the father said, yes, and Anne said, Yes, and she did suffer everything listed in this proposal, if you want to call it that. She suffered all these things. She lost friends. She lost children. She did suffer and eventually lose her own life, and she entered the destination of life, and countless Burmese Christians also left the broad way to enter the narrow way and found life that is in the Savior that Anne preached. Enter by the narrow gate. The broad, easy way will entice you. It leads to destruction. The narrow, hard way is difficult. It's unpopular, but he has traveled it before you. 
He will be with you on it, and it leads to eternal glory with him. Enter by the narrow gate. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your word would be sown deep in our hearts and it would do the supernatural thing that you promise it does. It will just grow and grow and your spirit would bear his fruit and it would push out the false affections that we have for this world and it would make us less distracted. So often we don't just wallow in explicit sinful things. We just waste our time because our affections are so low. Our ambition is so low. Our eyes aren't up to the holiday at the sea that's offered with you. And so I pray that we would be people who don't look to our own strength in traveling the hard road. But no, we only find the narrow way by your grace. We can't find the narrow way unless you draw us to it. We can't travel the hard road by our own strength. We have to Travel by your strength. Your power is made perfect in our weakness. And so I pray that we would. We'd be a people who look to your son and know that he is infinitely worthy and infinitely worth it. And let us, like Paul, say, to gain him, we gladly forsook all the rubbish that the world would offer us. Do that in our hearts by your spirit. And I pray in your son's holy name. Amen.